So our next presentation in distributed systems, one of the uh, super important aspect is monitoring. And uh, so today we have uh, Julius Foltz, who, are going, who is going to uh, tell us about Prometheus. Julius, all yours. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Julius. I'm one of the co-creators of the Prometheus monitoring system. And I got invited a bit uh, to talk a bit about it how it works, uh, what it is, uh, why we designed uh, certain things in Prometheus the way we did. Um, I forgot my own laptop. Oh no, I don't forget my own laptop. I forgot my power plug for my laptop at LinuxCon yesterday, which was a big screw up. And it's a quite special one. So I'm very thankful for using his laptop right now. Uh, the demo will be on my own. I still have a tiny bit of power left, hopefully sufficient for that. Um, but first, why? Uh, wh what does this talk about? Um, so when people come from a different kind of monitoring system to Prometheus, they often get a bit surprised by how it does things differently. Some pr decisions that we took might be a bit surprising, and you might even think, like, why did they do it like that? Isn't that stupid? Um, and uh, so I want to give a bit uh, insight into the reasoning behind some of these decisions and hopefully make you see that there was at least some thought behind it. You might not have to agree with that, of course, um, but it's all our opinion um, for how you build a good monitoring system. So just some background. Um, Prometheus got started when Matt Proud and I joined SoundCloud in 2012. And we both came from Google. We were kind of you know, used to the monitoring tools there. Um, but then we came to an environment in SoundCloud where they already had, which, which was revolutionary for the time, their own cluster scheduler system uh, based on containers. Before Docker existed, before Kubernetes and all that stuff existed. Um, and uh, this was called Bazooka and uh, it was based on you know, plain LXC, but it was already a highly dynamic environment where microservice instances were changing hosts and ports the whole time dynamically in a cluster. Um, so, and SoundCloud was not particularly reliably, uh, reliable at that time, and we were trying to monitor all these microservices better. The problem was we had this dynamically clustered wor scheduled word, but we didn't have uh, more modern monitoring tools. So we still had monitoring tools uh, that were made for a more static world. So like StatsD, Graphite, New Relic, uh, for the alerting side of things, Nagios. Um, and we were really unhappy with both the data models, the way you could query the data in those systems, um, but then also the efficiency in those approaches. And also, if you look at alerting, Nagios is a system which, besides being static, um, is one that doesn't really allow you a lot of flexibility in alerting uh, you know, based on the history of data. It only really knows uh, very brief check history and not a lot of depth. Um, so in the end, we decided to build a completely new monitoring system, which uh, turned out to be Prometheus, first introduced at SoundCloud. Uh, by now, it's a cloud-native computing foundation project, the second one after, uh, after Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, many companies uh, and people are both using it and contributing it. And I heard also that Docker is thinking of adding uh, native Prometheus metrics to their components, which is really exciting. <laughs> so I think we're going to have a conversation, maybe like a buff session about that tomorrow. Um, so first of all, just the scope. What is Prometheus? Um, Prometheus is really a numerical time series based monitoring system. And it's a whole ecosystem for doing that kind of monitoring. So we take care or define ways of you know, getting metrics out of the things you care about, whether it's services or network nodes or whatever, uh, in this kind of dimensional time series based uh, format. Um, collecting that data, storing it, uh, giving you a way to query the data, and then doing useful stuff with that. So waking people up at night if something goes wrong, which would be the alerting part. Um, and also, of course, having dashboards uh, or using that data to answer ad hoc debug questions about your system. <coughs> and our focus was very clearly on operational systems monitoring. Uh, so, you know, versus business metrics or so. 
and uh, Prometheus was speci specifically created to work well with dynamic systems, things where things float and shift around all the time, and you still want to be able to have the insight and be able to track where exactly a metric came from. So this is the general Prometheus architecture. The centerpiece of Prometheus is the Prometheus server, of which you would usually run one or multiple in your organization. Um, so for example, you could have one per team or you know, whatever suits your needs. And this server you configure to actively pull metrics from the things you care about. And the things you care about can be one of three different types, which is not completely clearly shown here. But um, one thing might be your services where you own the code and you can do anything to the code that you care about. So you can add direct Prometheus metrics to your code and expose it on an HTTP endpoint in a specific format where Prometheus can then pull it. Um, if you have things like a Linux node or a MySQL daemon, you know, code that you don't want to put an HTTP server in directly with Prometheus metrics, then what you usually do is you run a little sidecar job next to that thing, which Prometheus scrapes, and this little sidecar does the translation of the internal metric state to Prometheus metrics. And then you might also have some short-lived jobs which you just cannot scrape reliably at all, like a daily batch job which runs for a couple of seconds, deletes some users, and then just wants to report, I ran successfully and I deleted 200 users. For that, we have this gateway into the push world where these little jobs, but only the one that really need to, uh, can push something to the push gateway which acts as a metrics cache and then Prometheus server again pulls from that. Um, the way that Prometheus discovers what should be scraped is service discovery. At least I mean, you can configure things statically, but ideally it would use service discovery. Uh, we support ten, 10 different mechanisms for the major cloud and uh, cluster orchestration systems. Um, actually, it would be really cool to add native swarm kit discovery into there as well now, because the cool thing about that is that service discovery not only tells us where are all the services that we want to pull metrics from, but what is all the metadata about them? Is it a dev instance? Is it you know, all, the, all the labels coming from service discovery? Um, then, of course, you have the alert manager. Usually, you run only one of those in your company. That's kind of the central clearinghouse for alerts, which you define in the different Prometheus servers. They send alerts to the alert manager. The alert manager can correlate alerts, inhibit ones based on others. You can configure silences in there. And it also uses this dimensional data model that goes through the entire chain here to figure out where to route alerts, whether to send them to one team on email or to another team over PagerDuty, Slack, or whatever. And then you have various visualization options. Uh, I would say Prometheus has four main selling points, maybe even five. The, the fifth one I will mention later. Um, the biggest ones, I think, are, are the first two, the dimensional data model, um, being able to in really figure out where a metric came from and what it pertains to. And then a powerful query language, which we call PromQL, to work with that data model to answer questions about your system at any time. Um, then it's really efficient. A single node can do like 800,000 samples ingested per second. Um, for and you know, a single node can handle multiple millions of time series, and also stores them really, really, really efficiently on disk. Um, it's operationally really simple. You know what you always hear in Go talks is it's a static binary. You know, Prometheus is built in Go. It's a single static binary. You need a small config file for it. You just start it up and it starts writing to local disk. Um, and you know, it's so you can set it up in a couple of minutes. What does Prometheus not do? We want to kind of keep the scope to something manageable, so we don't do collection of raw logs where you need full detail on every event that happened. We only do, raw, uh, we only do aggregated time series data. But if you want to like, save every user request with their user ID and email and IP and so on, use a logging system. We don't do request tracing, use something like Zipkin for that. 
uh, we don't do magic style anomaly detection, you know, where we just go into your data, try to figure out automatically that something looks weird and wake someone up. Um, we only do very explicit queries that result in alerts. Um, we also punted on the whole long term, uh, kind of horizontally scalable, durable storage bit. Uh, there's ways for how you can do that externally in a decoupled way. Um, I'll talk a bit later about also why we made that decision. And uh, we also are focusing on monitoring, so we didn't really integrate user and authentication management into Prometheus itself. So this is kind of like the, the non-goals of Prometheus. Just, you know, some visual examples. Um, you have a built-in <laughs> expression browser in Prometheus where you can enter any PromQL expression um, and it will give you the current state of any result time series just to give you a glimpse into what the, uh, the cluster or whatever you're looking at currently looks like. Um, and then you can also graph things. So in this example, you have one example PromQL query here. Uh, the bazooka instant CPU time in nanoseconds um, is a counter and this is not just one number, it's actually a counter for every instance in the cluster, uh, keyed by dimensions such as app, proc, revision, and others, and I'm managing to use this thing here wrong. Um, probably have to move the mouse up again. Um, so this inner thing actually selects you know, thousands of time series, and then you're taking the rate as averaged over the last five minutes over all of these time series. Then we're saying, okay, we only want to see, uh, oh, yeah, we're summing up, over all dimensions, but we're preserving the app in proc dimensions, which in Bazooka mm, basically identify a service. Uh, and then we're taking the top three. So in this case, this would give us like the current uh, top three CPU consuming servers in the Bazooka cluster. So you could imagine a similar thing in a, in a swarm cluster, for example. Uh oh. Okay, let's try again. Ah, it worked. Oh, okay. Um, so the data model is the first kind of design point I really want to talk about, not because it's particularly controversial, but because it's different than other monitoring systems. So uh, you might know StatsD and Graphite, which have an either you know, flat or more hierarchical data model. And as Steve already mentioned in his talk, it gets a bit inflexible to work with that kind of data model. Um, you know, in Prometheus, we have a metric name and just a bunch of key value pairs attached to it, and all the key value pairs attached to a metric name result in uh, identify one time series. And so you might have the total number of HTTP requests in the system, and then you know the path they happened on, the status code, and so on. If you try to encode the same kind of data in a hierarchical data model, it would look somewhat like on the right side. People might be familiar with this kind of thing from systems like Graphite. And now if we query, for example, for er everything that has a method equals post, it would look really explicit in a label-based data model. You see exactly what you're selecting on and you don't need to know how many other path components there are. You don't need to implicitly know which path component means what. And also in a hierarchical data model, uh, depending on the place in the tree, the different hierarchical components might have totally different meanings depending on which application they belong to. So uh, we think that label-based data model is better for this cross, uh, for this cross-cutting selection. Uh, could be more efficient. The hierarchical model might not be indexed as well for doing this cross-cutting selection, and it's more explicit. Um, we have a non-SQL query language which trips some people up. Um, so with time series databases, often people think, well, you know. SQL is a language that all these data analysts already know, so let's invent a dialect based on that. With PromQL, we went for a completely custom language. So let's look at some examples of what PromQL looked like for typical queries versus uh, you know, a SQL-like dialect that I just invented. Um, again, here you have a query for um, the total number of IPI requests of a certain system. This is not just not one number again. This selector selects potentially hundreds or thousands of time series. And you take the rate as averaged over five minutes over all these, all these uh, points. Um, 
and it will actually automatically then propagate the same labels as the input set had into the output set. So the output set will have the same number of elements, the same number of time series with the same labels, but just with the rate applied to them, kind of like a map in a functional language. I could imagine that in a SQL-like dialect, this would look somewhat like this. You'd have to explicitly say, I want to select all these labels in the output. You could use a star, but then you might double select the value of which you only want to have the rate, and then you know, have the metric as the table. Eh, not, too, not too bad. Maybe another example. Let's say you have the temperature in Celsius and you measure it like in all kinds of places in the world, and you want to average it up by city, but only for cities in Germany. This could look like this. In PromQL, again, the output set would be the, the average temperature uh, in every city in Germany. I think, again, this wouldn't be too bad in the SQLite dialect. could look something like this. But what about a use case, which is really common in Prometheus, where you want to do binary arithmetics or filtering or comparisons between two whole sets of time series? So again, in this case, you might have the total number of errors as a counter in a service and the total number of requests. And you might want to calculate an error ratio. Again, this is many numbers, and this is many numbers because it's all dimensional. And the divided by here automatically joins up matching label sets on the left and right to produce an equal cardinality output set. Uh, and there's many ways to play with that. If you have different dimensionalities on different sides, there's modifiers. Uh, but this is a simple example. This would give you the error ratio. So I think, I'm not sure, but it could look somewhat like this in a SQL-style dialect. Um, again, you're selecting all the labels. Uh, you're dividing here. Then you have to explicitly join. Uh, I omitted a bunch of stuff because it would have gotten too long. Um, so basically, you end up like with a pretty unwieldy query. Um, so the conclusion for us was at least, you know, PromQL, we think it's better for the kind of metrics computation that we typically want to do in Prometheus. And also, PromQL from the beginning was designed to only do reads, only selects, basically. So why always say select, select, select if you're only reading anyways? Um, and writing happens through a different out-of-band path. My favorite topic, pull versus push. <laughs> um, how much time do I have left? Let's just check. Oh, OK, we started late anyways. Lots of time. <laughs> um, so this causes some FUD. Sometimes, um, FUD is something that the Docker world should be familiar with. Uh, <laughs> so we really like push. We also acknowledge that uh, we really like pull. Um, we also acknowledge that in some situations it will create problems for people. But I want to kind of outline what we think is nice about a pull-based approach to gathering metrics. Um, first of all, when you pull directly from all the things you care about, and one pull fails, you already have one signal that something is wrong. You know that instance might be down. or might You can already use that for basic health monitoring. Um, you can do something like horizontal monitoring. That's kind of a term coined by one of our contributors, where let's say you have team A with their monitoring stack and their service stack, and team B with their monitoring and their service stack. Um, now, maybe team B wants to know some metrics from over here because they're interesting for them. Uh, in a push-based world, now you'd have to talk to that other team and say, can you configure all your instances to push to two monitoring systems, but only some of them? Um, so in a pull-based world, all you have to do is change your own monitoring system to pull in exactly the metrics that you want. You should, of course, maybe still talk to the other team. But you know, you can be very flexible about what you put, pull from where and only configure that in the monitoring system. Um, in general, a pull-based approach makes these kinds of things very flexible. So the thing that you can also do is run a copy of production monitoring on your laptop by just you know, copying the same Prometheus config to your laptop, running it, and you'll get the same data, of course, you know, if you're on the VPN and, and, and so on. But that allows you to play with the monitoring, break it, try out different alerting rules, and all these kinds of things. Um, it also allows you to run two completely identically configured Prometheus servers in production to get high availability in a very simple way. They don't talk to each other, 
but they pull in the same data. Mm. And now they can calculate the same alerts based on the same pulled in data and both send it to alert manager. So if one goes down, you still get the alert from the other one and alert manager will actually deduplicate based on the label set. Uh, now there's one thing where people come, yeah, but a pull-based system really needs is really hard because now I need to have a lot of configuration in my monitoring system. It needs to know where all the things are in the world. Um, it's really cumbersome. And then I would say, well, you kind of need to know that anyways. Uh, if you're building a monitoring system, it should know what should be out there in the world. Um, and so I would say you need that part anyways in the monitoring system. Otherwise, it cannot tell you if some instance is doing crazy stuff or is completely not reporting in or so. Um, and but in a pull-based world, the instances themselves don't need to, do, need to know anything. In a push-based world, additionally, you will need configuration in all your services uh, to know who they are so that they can attach their identity to the metrics they're sending, and they need to know where monitoring lives, which also ties into this flexibility aspect. Um, last point, yes, pull scales actually pretty well. I wrote a whole blog post on that on the Prometheus IO blog. If you go to Prometheus IO blog, you'll find it in there. Um, but of course, people have problems in certain setups with pull. For example, if they have you know a firewalled off network segment, or it gets even worse if if they're doing IoT stuff and they have like the Internet of Things devices in people's homes and how can they pull from there? So, admittedly, this is not the best use case for Prometheus. Um, Oops. But for many of these cases, there are alternatives and workarounds. So in general, we recommend people to run Prometheus anyways as close as possible to the monitored targets and services. Uh, because then you know you have fewer things. Whoa, it's doing things by itself. That's amazing. What's it doing? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyways, run Prometheus on the same network segment, fewer moving parts, uh, better. Um, you could open ports, of course, to pull through certain things, but of course that wouldn't work if you in this IoT scenario and you can't like ask people to open ports in their plastic routers so you can pull from their homes or so. That's pretty unrealistic. Or you know, open a tunnel from your devices to some place in the internet from where you can then can pull. Eh, not that great. Anyways, so that wasn't really, I mean, Prometheus is more made for this kind of scenario where you're in a data center, you have full access to the stuff that's in there, you can pull, you can pull from there. Um, anyways, so the next point is one, yeah, this is also one that's going to be interesting to discuss with the Docker people, like Steve. Um, having, this is philosophy difference around whether you have one big exporter uh, on, a, on, on a machine that collects all the metrics for that machine and then Prometheus just collects it from that exporter or whether you run one pr uh, exporter process per process that you care about, per service process, for example. Um, let's say you had this kind of Uber exporter on a machine. Um, and you have all kinds of different applications pushing their metrics to that exporter. You know, a MySQL server, some host uh, statistics, and maybe a web application that runs there. It's pretty cool, right? They only need to push locally to a big Uber exporter. Then Prometheus can come and collect the metrics data from there, and all is good. But um, this has a couple of downsides again. So first of all, it's a bit of an operational bottleneck. Uh, the services on the host might belong to totally different people uh, and groups and again this uh, single Uber agent on the machine might belong also to a different service group and now they all have to kind of talk to each other. Uh, it becomes a single point of failure with little isolation between the different metrics you push there. So one user pushing too much can maybe break everyone else. It gets harder for the monitoring to just scrape exactly the metrics that it wants. So the thing is, usually, if you have a shared cluster in your organization, uh, you'll have, and especially if you're running on a dynamic cluster scheduler, you have all kinds of services from all kinds of different teams running on the same node, 
and you might only be interested in the web app on that node, not the MySQL D, not the host stats, and so on. Um, so that makes that scenario a bit more difficult. Um, it's harder to do upness monitoring and the metadata association. Remember, in the pull-based data model with uh, Prometheus, we get metadata about the things we pull from, from the service discovery mechanism. It tells us this is a development instance and it has these and these other labels and properties, and then we can map that into the time series data. Um, and then when we see a, a scrape to a specific process fails, we know exactly for which labels that failed and can alert with exactly these labels and root on these labels and they give you a lot of information. Now, if you first push that stuff locally to an exporter and then Prometheus pulls it, they the, the services will have to push the data with the I right identity data to that single Uber exporter and the monitoring system will need equivalent configuration to then join that data up and know what is wrong and what's missing. Um, so this becomes harder also. So in general, what we recommend is really running one exporter per process for these processes that you cannot directly instrument, like a Linux host or a MySQL daemon where you wouldn't want to go hack into the C code. Um, if it's your own process, go directly to your own process and instrument directly. This way, Prometheus knows exactly, keyed by all the nice dimensions coming from the service discovery, what's out there, is it healthy, and which metrics belong to what. Cool. Um, so why didn't we do clustering? We have only the simple local storage. Um, first thing, I mean, clustering is really hard to get right. Uh, some people ask for it, you know, like, we just want to be able to have all data forever and scale horizontally and have it recover gaps in one node from another node and so on. But clustering is also hard to get right and it's the first thing that might break in case of a network outage, for example, um, and you, you want your monitoring system to be always up with the most recent data. That's the most important thing, uh, that it can still use the most recent data to alert. And if you just run two Prometheus servers in this replicated HA mode where they don't talk to each other but pull in the same data, you will have that guaranteed. So that actually makes for a more uh, stable and a simpler system in total. <coughs> so in the conclusion, I could talk about many more points, but then I think it would get too long here. Um, for me, it's not so much about Prometheus specifically, but more about all these different uh, monitoring philosophies and decision points that we took in Prometheus. Um, if Prometheus died tomorrow, that's fine, uh, as long as you know, I would like to see the same decisions in other systems. And I would love to work together with the Docker people to uh, yeah, integrate Prometheus metrics, of course, um, and, and think about how to apply some of these best practices. And I acknowledge, uh, I already talked to Steve, uh, some opinions are already different, and we need to kind of figure out what, what's best for everyone in the end. Um, I have a demo. For that, I will need my own laptop. And this awesome USB Ethernet adapter. And using the last power that's remaining in my laptop, I will hope that this will out work out. Oops. It's fine, it's fine. So, do, do, do. working. Um, and do I have Ethernet connectivity? So the first thing I want to do is just uh, show you locally without containers how to set up Prometheus with like a minimal uh, just Linux node monitoring just to show how few moving parts there are. I have a directory with two static binaries and one little config file. Um, one is the central Prometheus server itself and it has a configuration file. It's a simple YAML based format. In this case, I'm just scraping two services. Prometheus is scraping itself on this 9090 port and will scrape a so-called node exporter, which is one of these little sidecar jobs which 
basically uh, exports Linux host metrics. So it goes like to the PROC file system and the SysFS file system uh, and extracts Linux host statistics from there and exports them in a Prometheus format. And the node exporter is not yet running. So it should actually fail to pull from there. And of course, there's many more config options, but this is just to keep it simple. Now I can just say Prometheus. By default, it will read from that Prometheus YAML. And I should be able to get to my Prometheus server. It's up and running. Um, I should see in the targets that the node exporter is down because it's not running yet. I statically configured it in this case. Normally, you would serv use service discovery and it would discover maybe even multiple targets for each service. So let's bring it up, see how that works. You can specify many flags here, but by default it will do kind of the right thing um, and export a lot of metrics. So I started this node exporter and now it's up in Prometheus. And we can actually check the endpoint here um, and look what this format looks like. So it reports some metrics, you know, one time series per line with all these dimensional metrics. Uh, dimensional labels. It, support, uh, it exports some metrics about the node exporter process itself, like how many Go routines are in there and so on. These kind of get included automatically when you're using the Go client library for Prometheus. And then there's all these node metrics, like the counters for every CPU and CPU mode, how much CPU time in seconds was already used uh, since system boot up. Um, disk metrics, and so on and so on. So we can go to this query interface, ask for like all the node CPU metrics, getting back many time series. We might not care about every individual CPU, but first let's take a, actually, yeah. I'll just say, let's actually sum that up. But man, that only gives us one number, so maybe we want to just get rid of the CPU ID information because we don't care about the individual cores. So now we get a limited result back. We don't have much data collected yet, so let's do it like this. But this is a counter that just goes up forever, so that's boring. So we want to take the rate over that uh, as averaged over, let's say, the last 15 seconds, because we're collecting every second here. And now we're getting a CPU rate. Um, and the rate is taking the per second rate of a second's value gives us the ratio, so if we want it the usage, it would be uh, 100, as a, that would be percent. And if we only wanted the idle mode, we could say only give us the idle CPU mode, and now we would know in percent uh, how much percent we are idle, and we have multiple cores, so it's more than 100. Um, we could actually do average without CPU, then we should get something that is under 100. So that's basically just some very simple PromQL query examples on how to get started with Prometheus in like really one minute. Um, the Jerome Petersoni from Docker was really nice and set me up with like a five node EC2 swarm cluster. And I'm going to try uh, bringing up Prometheus on that one now. Uh, so I first wanted to show really, eh, okay, maybe, maybe it's not gonna work. Oh, right, I forgot. Yeah, that's actually cable would really help. Of course. I thought I had already plugged this in. This is genius. Okay. Hmm. Ah. All right. Cool. The remaining battery will be enough. Um, so I have, I have a little swarm cluster here. Uh, how do I do this? Node LS. Yeah, I have five nodes here. Uh, I'm not really. Uh, Docker specialist, so I'll probably do some things wrong. But uh, first, I'll create a, a network called prom. Oh, too many commands. Okay. Create network. Okay, I will just like Docker create, no, network create, right? Uh, prom. And uh, then I will start a node exporter. Um, this is this one. So the, the, the tricky bit is normally this node exporter process should be run not in a container because it really needs to get to all your proc and sys file systems and to the host system actually to get all the metrics it needs. 
But if we do want to run it in a container, we can mount, like bind mount all these things from the host into the container so it can read the same things and it ends up reporting pretty much the same metrics. And just for the demo, I'm also adding a publish here so we can play with it in the browser. Um, so let's start the node exporter. Uh, ah, right, 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 right. Yep, I need the overlay network. Uh, RM from okay, Docker network RM from uh, Docker network. This one, yeah, that's why I had actually all the commands. Okay, uh, let's create the node exporter again. Um, main exporter, and so it's on there. So that's cool. Sh we should be able to see it uh, on this IP in the cluster. And uh, by the way, this uh, global thing that I did there started the node exporter on every node in the cluster. Um, this mode equals global. So if I SSH into any of the other nodes now, it will be uh, on any of the other nodes. And this is actually a load balanced endpoint over all the node exporters just for a demo. Um, I'll bring up C advisor. C ad which is a container exporter. It exports metrics about all the containers running on the host. Um, and then I'll bring up Prometheus itself. And all I did here is I have a little Docker file that just inherits from the standard vanilla Prometheus Docker file and just swaps out the Prometheus configuration. Just for the demo, uh, simplest hack to get a different configuration file in there. And uh, so I'm going to build that. I'm going to add actually a custom registry, this one. And I'm going to push that image to that custom registry, just so that you know we have that configuration file baked in there. And now we're going to, again, create, mm -mm -mm. where is it? Ah, Grafana can come later. So we're going to create the Prometheus container. So now we should also have Prometheus running here. How much time do I have left? Like zero minutes? One, two, okay, perfect. That's all I need. Um, we have Prometheus running here. Um, we can start Grafana. And we'll have Grafana running on the same IP. And what we can do now is log in, admin, admin. It's always the default in Grafana. Uh, create a data source. Data sort Prometheus. Uh, type Prometheus. Um, and the cool thing here is now we can refer to the Docker name. So that would be just prom on port 9090. Uh, I think without this. Proxy it through Grafana. That should work. Yep, data sales is working. And now we can create a dashboard. Say, OK, let's create a new graph um, from this Prometheus data source with, um, I'm going to get like a cheat sheet query here. Uh, steps. Beep. For example, uh, hmm, could just get this one, put it in here, and we're getting the data. And of course, we don't have six hours of data yet. We have maybe a couple of minutes. Um, and it's, it's showing that query. So that's basically how you could set up that in very hacky way briefly on Docker Swarm. We have now node metrics from all the nodes in our Swarm. Um, we also would have container metrics. I didn't go into that. Um, and you can see that actually the way we configured the Prometheus uh, on the Swarm cluster is that it discovers the different tasks of a Swarm kit service via DNS. And there it would be better to not just use DNS, but use like talk directly somehow to the managers or however, however that works and get the real label-based metadata for each instance so that we can map it into the time series. Um, but you can see that it actually has discovered five C advisors, one for every node, and five node exporters, and one Prometheus server. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, 
I hope to see you around, and uh, thank you very much. And of course, I'm open for questions if there is still time. <laughs> Sure, yeah, we can just do questions at the, uh, what's it called? Birds of a Feather, exactly, yeah. Or you have a 30 minute break or you can stop. Or a 30 minute break. I might go, I have to run yeah. and try to get a power supply for my laptop before I go to London, otherwise I'm royally screwed. Yeah. So, yeah, but I'll definitely be more around, either today or tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow I'll be definitely here, so let's discuss all the Prometheus things then. Cool, thank you very much.